Hi, I'm Mark Baumgarten, host of Mark Who 42. I may like Doctor Who, but I also like reading. And when I don't have time to read, which, which is most of the time because I have work and I have the show that you're listening to, I like to listen to audiobooks, and I do so in my car. And I got a deal for you. If you go to audibletrial.com slash markwho42, you can get a free audiobook plus a membership with Audible. You can get Doctor Who books. You can get nonfiction books. You can get fiction books. You can choose from over 180,000 titles to download. And remember, you get a free audiobook if you try audibletrial.com slash marku42. You'll get a free membership for a month. And if you like it, you can stick with it at fourteen ninety five a month, getting another audiobook each month, plus being a member of their book club. So try audible.com with marku42 at audibletrial.com slash marku42. <laughs> This is Chase Masterson from Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Doctor Who Big Finish, and my spinoff, Vienna. You're listening to Mark Who 42. How cool is that? Welcome to Mark Who 42. That's right, Mark Who 42. I'm your host, Mark Baumgarten. With me, as ever, are Christian Basil, Eduardo M. Breyer, Trish Helm, and Patty Hawkins. But we've got our very special, special guest, Chase Masterson. Hello, Chase. Hey, guys. Hi, Brian. Thank you, Mark, and everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Yay. Well, thank you, Chase. <laughs> We're talking to Lita. We're talking to Lita. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. I'm you will address her as her title to wife of the Grand Nagus, you worm. That's right. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, to be sure. Yes. So, since you are the Grand Nagus' wife, what does that make you to Nog? Is that the, you're her... You're, Mother-in-law? I, the mother? I am nothing to Nog, but a total I confusion. Nog was, I thought like, Nog was Rom's <laughs> son. Nog is Rom's son. So that, well, that, would then, make her, that would make her whatever the Ferengi equivalent to stepmom is. Stepmom. Okay. Yeah, that would be like, dude, is that your mom? <laughs> <laughs> she wears Nog, clothes. Nog is you, all of a sudden a that? lot more popular in Starfleet Academy. <laughs> no, well, you know, hey, that's how it goes, I guess. Now, Chase, you're not a stranger to internet-based radio talk shows, are you? You uh, did a show for the fandom back in 2004, 2005. I did. I hosted the fandom and did a whole bunch of really cool conversations with amazing people. It was so much fun. It's something that we may actually be looking to reignite one of these days, but I don't know because you guys have pretty much got that covered, so <laughs> I don't know if I can compete. Thank you very much. Hey, between, I put the, everybody, I put the rest of them on mute. Between you and me, I'll totally team up with you on that. I'll ditch these losers. Okay, I'm, I'm on unmute even now, and we'll talk to everybody else. Okay, but, all right, hey, guys, let's go. I think we got dissension in the ranks here, Mark. I don't know what that was. All right. Anyway, hello. Oh, jeez. So can you tell us, everybody who's out there listening who may not know who you are, tell us a little about yourself. Oh, I always love that. Thank you. Well, why are you listening if you don't know who I am? Go find something better to do. <laughs> no, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> that, that we want them to listen to our show. We don't want to listen to our ratings. No, no, no. Okay, that's true. That's true. Sorry, everyone. My apologies. Fine. Um, No, I'm grateful listen, that you're, you're here. You're getting an Whether education. It, whether you know or not, um, I'm really happy to, to still be aboard in these fantastic sci-fi circles. I, I was on Deep Space Nine for five years, and we made a lot of cool noise with that show. It was the number one syndicated show in the world when we went off the air. It was a fantastic run. I, I got to be on for the last five years and work with some incredible people, tell some amazing stories. And I think the great thing about DS9 is that it really holds up. I mean, there are so many people that say, you know, here... 20 years later, how much the stories mean to them and how much they get out of watching the show. And though it's been, you know, it's been wrapped for 19 years now. Yeah. I like Deep Space Nine. Uh, I, I like the episodes you've been in. Uh, and I have you. I do have, you know what, I have a question about one of those episodes and what it was like to act in it. You got to be in one of the Mirror Universe episodes that I Deep did. Space Nine tackled. And you got to play a Mirror Universe version of your character. What's it like playing your character, but from like a different angle? Well, Gosh, you know, it's funny. I, I guess you always want to find a way to play your character from a different angle. 
you always want to find new things in that person to bring to the table. So uh, the concept of it is not completely foreign, even in general, for an actor. Um, this was fun. I only had a couple lines, but people have made a, a big deal of it, I guess, because Lita was flirting with Esri. And, you know, I don't know what came next, and I'm not asking, <laughs> but... Um, but it was a fun episode to shoot, and and you know I was I was so I was so I don't know I mean I always think that Lita Lita has always been rather forthright I mean even in her initial approach to Dr Bashir Lita came up with a really kind of a cool way of doing it, it wasn't like hey baby you want to go have a drink it was more like. <laughs> You know, I think I'm sick. Can you help me? And so it's kind of fun to see Lita making another excuse, like we're going to debrief you um, <laughs> to Esri. Is that what they're calling it nowadays? That's what they're calling it nowadays. How well, do you know one of my pickup lines? That's just that's just weird. <laughs> wow. Uh, now, okay. Geez. I think I, I think Christian, if you want to pull that off, you have to be member of some sort of uh, rebel cell. I'm going to make Chase feel happy now. Chase, you were named one of the ten sexist alien sexiest. Sorry. <laughs> Sexiest aliens Ten on TV aliens. back in 2009. <laughs> you were one of the sexiest it? aliens, too. No, the sexiest alien. Oh, the sexiest. Well, she got married to one of the sexist aliens. Of the <laughs> I, think, men, so. I think you guys are sexist aliens. Yeah, I don't we know. Are. Yeah, we are. Yeah. You're also one of the top 25 TV hotties. I mean, you... you it's you, so you still weird. Look good. You, you're great. Isn't that weird? It's so weird. It's just weird. I mean, I was not not even close. Not the cute girl in high school at all. I was the shy one. I was, if I may say so, just to be honest, I was the smart one. Mm-hmm. I won, not to my credit, because this did not get me dates. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I. Uh, wait, 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 I'm backing up. It did not get me dates, and I'm I'm being facetious about not to my credit. I am proud of having been the smart girl, but winning four spelling bees in a row does not make you popular at, you no, know. No, you know, I, I, I will agree to that. In, in You know, in in that era in, in Texas where I grew up, it just wasn't the thing. People, it wasn't, wasn't like, wow, you're smart, let me get to know you. It was just not like that at all. And that was tough for me. Then you became a dabble girl. Well, then I became a dabble girl, and everyone's saying this word sexy, which I don't get, but whatever. They're entitled to their own opinions. I, I got to disagree, because the, the girls, especially the girls from my school, growing up, you know, they and they, they've they always told me, it's just like, yeah, I couldn't get dates and all that stuff. But today, not a problem. So I'm glad that the nerdy girls always win, I think. I think they always, and they always become the hot girls, and they're smart. They're incredibly smart. I I'll think it's just justice. It is justice. It is justice. It is. Chase, this is a Doctor Who radio show, and I want to find out, especially because you called yourself a nerd, did you watch Doctor Who while growing up? I did some. Not a lot. It was not playing in a lot of the places I grew up. I, I, my dad was in the Army, and I grew up kind of all over. And so I lived in Alaska, and we had like two channels, you know, and it's changed a lot. But back then, it was not the booming metropolis of Anchorage that it is now. Um, we lived in Germany for a little while. Um, I grew up a lot of my years in Texas back and forth, and it, there just wasn't the Doctor Who that there is now, certainly. Right. But um, but I knew of the show and was really enthralled by it. And I'm so happy to be able to be introduced to more of it from this angle, you know? I mean, I'm just so grateful to get to know these guys, to get to know Tom Baker and Colin Baker particularly and Sylvester <laughs> McCoy. Those are the three that I, I know the best. But I've certainly met a bunch of them. And what a cool group, man. I mean, they're just fun and playful, and it's just such a neat thing to be a part of. What was it like working with Tom Baker in Night of the Storm Crow? It was really fun. I mean, the thing is, like, you know, you come into the day knowing that, okay, I'm going to be working with an icon. I mean, <laughs> he's, he was like, you know, our generation's Doctor Who. I mean, he's the guy, you know. And the Tom. The Tom. The Tom. Yeah, and so you really... I've made it a point to really tread lightly with those people. I've been able to work with a bunch of really cool people whose careers, you know, I knew beforehand. And, you know, you got to be careful. You can't be like, oh, gosh, Tom, it's so nice to meet you. It just doesn't work because then they're self-conscious. And, uh, you know, I could have really fangirled out, but I didn't. And it was great to just see him relax and be at home feeling cool and talking just like a regular guy, not talking about work or classic Doctor Who, but like, just just being cool, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Chase, I got a question for you, speaking of which. 
how did you go from nerdy schoolgirl to getting bitten by the acting bug? Uh, well, that's a good question. I did both at the same time, actually. My mom was a theater director, and I grew up working. I did my first play when I was five years old, and I worked in the theater all during high school. And um, I went to UT in the middle of high school to do some work there and then came back to high school. And I was always nerdy and always an actress. And part of that was because I never saw being an actress as being equated with pretty or sexy or popular. I loved the work for the work's sake. I love the communication factor and the ability we have to tell great stories and communicate through this incredibly powerful medium. There's just a huge amount of power and capability that we have in that. And I was touched by stories and wanted to tell them. And it didn't matter to me that I was geeky or nerdy or that I was like <laughs> the girl with almost no friends and I wore like six tortoise shell glasses and like had my hair come down over my face because I didn't want to show my face and I, you know I was embarrassed to be getting any shape at all to me because I was so shy and yet it didn't make a difference because the stories are more powerful than anything you know yeah I do get it. Um, I've heard a lot about RUR Genesis and RUR. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah. Um, RUR, for, for you guys who are not familiar with it, RUR is the seminal piece of science fiction that was the inspiration for Blade Runner, uh, well, in order, inspiration for Metropolis, Blade Runner, iRobot, anything that has a robot in it. RUR is a play that was written by Czechoslovakian playwright, Carl Chopik in 1918, and it was the first use of the word robot. Robot means worker in Czech, and so the idea of this play is that they created robots to do their work for them. And, you know, obviously then all of these issues come in about human rights and what makes a person human and all of that. What right do we have to invade upon anybody else's rights? None, basically. So this is a really cool piece. Very says a lot of very important things socially. There's a writer-director that I've worked with before named James Kerwin who got the rights to do RUR. Uh, he got the title rights from the MPAA. We shot a short called RUR Genesis, which you can find at rurfilm.com. And it's a concept piece to raise money for the feature. Okay. Yeah. I've heard good things about it. I've heard good yeah. things. Yeah. Thank you. It's a really strong piece. Go watch it right now and then come back. Uh, we'll, maybe we'll do that during the commercial break. <laughs> okay, maybe you will. You know what I mean. No. <laughs> um, it, you know, it is exactly. Um, RURfilm.com, I think, is the website. I'll tell you real fast. The film is being done by an award-winning team. James Kerwin is the writer-director for Yesterday Was a Lie, which right. is a sci-fi noir shot in classic black and white that I was one of the leads in. And it is a beautiful film. It won over a dozen Best Feature Awards on the festival circuit. It was named the New Filmmaker Award, lots and lots of really cool things. We got a cool theatrical release and then a great DVD release by Entertainment One. The whole film was made for $200,000, and most people peg it at something like 5 to $10 million. It's a beautiful piece of work. I will also say, not to sound braggy, but I produced it. Oh, um, okay. Yes, I did. Yeah. Oh. Um, I was originally cast in the feature, and the producers fell out, and that's Hollywood speak for we want more money and we're holding out on you. So I just said, well, <laughs> and I, I, I tried to find other producers, and we interviewed 37 more producers, each of whom turned down this paying job. You know, even though it was a fantastic project, it was just all about money. So I said, well, damn it, I'll do it. And I produced this film, and I got it made just the way you'd make tacos you know what do we need <laughs> uh, you know okay i guess we need um taco shells and lettuce uh cheese uh, okay what do we need we need a camera and costumes and locations and i just common sensed it so that's, there. Uh, that's pretty much how this radio show gets together we think of tacos exactly. we put it yeah. together <laughs> exactly <laughs> what do we need exactly. cheese lettuce a microphone I'll admit, I have not always been a big fan of Star Trek. I mostly saw the classic series. But then I was looking through okay. your filmography, and I saw that you were in a movie that I really love, which was Robin Hood Men in Tights. Ah, so funny. <laughs> and I just wanted to know, how was it? Thank you. Uh, it's so funny. Hardly anybody. Oh, my God, it was a blast. It was so much fun. And, I, you know, I, I saw Carrie Elways at, at uh, New York Comic Con um, last year, and he's such a sweetheart. We had a blast working on that film. I was only on it for one day, but I'll tell you the quarry of how I got in the film, okay? Okay. If I may. All right, so Mel Brooks was doing general auditions, and he 
brought me in, and it was very rare for a director of his stature to do general auditions, but he was. And he and I just got along. I mean, we just had a fun time meeting each other. And so he didn't know what role anyone was going in for. He wrote this role, Lady Godiva, and he gave it to me. So that's fantastic. Until I get a call that we are writing that role out, sorry, we'll look for something else for you. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. That's like the kiss of death. You, 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 you don't say, you know, it, you, you, you don't ever rely on anything like that. Like we're going to find something else for you because it just won't happen. So I thought, oh gosh, I need to be in this movie. What am I going to do? So I thought, how do you mean a Mel Brooks movie? You make him laugh. <laughs> so I got this scroll because it's Robin Hood. And I wrote in calligraphy on this big scroll. It was like the size of like my arm span. And I wrote in calligraphy with put with red tassels and everything. There once was an actress named Chase who had a quite pliable face. Lead supporting or bit, she was a sure hit. Mr. Brooks, you must find me a place. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. And he did. They wrote the role of this giggling court lady for me and put me in there next to Richard Lewis. And I got in the movie. Well, then... Okay, one more thing. Story's not over. We shot a cool little scene. And then at the premiere, as I'm so excited to see these scenes, Mel comes running across the restaurant. It was a little gathering before the movie. He said, Bubala, Bubala. I don't know what word that is, but that's what he said. Bubala, I have to tell you, I loved you in the movie, but you got cut out. And I said, oh, gosh, thank you. But why? And he said, well, the jokes were timely. They didn't fit. And it was something about Richard Lewis being a fresh prince. And they thought because fresh prince of Bel Air... I don't know. They just didn't feel like that would hold up through the years. So anyway, but he, then he looked at me and with a little wink, he said, but I left you in a little bit so you'd get paid. Oh, that's, that's great. That's good. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? That, that is. is. What a great human. I've heard nothing but great things about Mel Brooks. Yeah. Yeah. He's pretty, he's pretty awesome. Neat man. And he's a very dear friend of a very dear friend of mine. And, yeah, it's just so great when icons are good human beings, you know? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's great Patrick, to hear. are you writing this yeah. down? We're going to have to head over to Mel Brooks' house and grab some scrolls on the way up there. Uh, yes, you guys, definitely. Uh, get our See poetry there. thing going. No, yeah, I'm, yeah, just yeah. Gonna eat, I'm just going to eat a lot of beans and, uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. Some more beans, Mr. Tiger? I said you boys have had enough. <laughs> okay, if you're going to be gross, I think we should take a commercial break. Yeah, I think we're going to take a commercial break. When we come back, Chase, I'd like to talk to you about Vienna mm -hmm. and many other things in you. your life and in Doctor Who and Big Finish. Hooray! So we'll be right back with more of Mark Who 42 on Krypton Radio. Now, wait, All right, Mark Who 42. He said it out off? loud. Does that mean he has to die? Or yes, I'm can sorry. Say it? No, I didn't, no, say no. I didn't say Vienna Salvatore. Uh oh Oh, darn it, no, Mark! I'm gonna have to, i got to think about this over our commercial break. In the meantime, go watch R.U.R. R.U.R. Uh, I'm going to watch R.U.R. Okay. We'll be right back. Okay. Make will, Mark. Uh-oh. <laughs> Attention all Whovians! While you're waiting for the new episode of Doctor Who, start your own adventures with a book from Mark Who 42 Books. They carry unique and rare books at affordable prices. Visit Amazon.com slash shops slash Mark Who 42. That's Amazon.com slash shops slash Mark Who 42. Mark Who 42 Books. Set your imagination free into the Hooniverse. Welcome to a collaboration between the GeekCast Radio Network and the Pop Culture Network. This is From the Command Center, the podcast. I am your host, TFG and Mike from the GCRN, and joining me is Zordon himself. Uh, oh, uh, wait. I mean, Scotty Cash. That's right. Scotty Cash from the Pop Culture Network. And today we're introducing you to the audio version of From the Command Center, the podcast that will tell our intake on Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the episodes, the seasons, and all that other good stuff. of science. Here is the lab director and your human host, Dr. Geek. <laughs> Come on, thou little Schrodinger. You can tell me it's Auntie Claire. <laughs> Claire, what 
are you up to? Trying to decide if this cat is stupid or pretending to be stupid. Tricky. Let me guess. If you could talk to the animals, then you could really do something. Are you mocking me? I wouldn't dare. That's good. Think of it, Geek. We could finally learn the deepest secret of all. Which is? What does the fox say? Okay. Well, the idea of translating a pet's thoughts and vocalizations into speech is not a new one. The Japanese toy company Takara has created Bowlingle, a computer-based dog-to-human language translation device. In fact, the inventors of Bowlingle were awarded the IG Nobel Prize, the parody of the real thing, for promoting peace and harmony between the species. Well, let's see what it can do with cats. Well, the device is presented as a translator, but it's really more of an emotional analyzer. Our universal translator could do the job, but I'm pretty sure I know what's on Schrodinger's mind. But I must know his secrets. Okay. Deus, please bring the universal translator online. Confirmed. Now, Schrodinger, what are you going on about? <laughs> Silly human, give me some tuna. We spent millions on a universal translator to learn that. At least we know the translation's accurate. Here you go, Shro. <sighs> well, I guess that's all we're going to learn today. So till next time, remember to apply your geekdom. This moment of science was brought to you by Dr. Geek's Laboratory of Applied Geekdom, a Brazen Wench production, copyright 2015, in association with this network. Join the adventure. Download the full labcast at www.drgeeklab.com and follow us at facebook.com slash drgeeklab and twitter.com slash drgeeklab. I, Starstream, have taken over Transformers Prime Time. Call me Lord. No, Starscream, we will not call you Lord, but we will announce that the GCRN is bringing everyone Transformers Prime Time. That's right, before we get into the TFG1 Redone, we enter the Prime Universe. Join your hosts, TFG1 Mike, Steve Megatron, Optimus Solo, and Pecan Court Michael as they cover all 65 episodes of Transformers Prime, the comics, the toys, and more. We will also have a commentary on Predacons Rising, interviews with writers, voice actors, and more. All in the latest Transformers review podcast from the GeekCast Radio Network, you can find TF Primetime on iTunes and www.geekcastradio.com. And remember, one shall stand and one shall fall. Hello, I'm Katie Manning, and I played Joe Grant in Doctor Who, later to become Joe Grant Jones in the Sarah Jane Adventures, and you are listening to Mark Who 42. Hmm, is not the answer to life. Well, this program certainly has been that to me today. Okay, you guys are nuts. I don't know how this ever happened. Who introduced me to you? I don't. Oh, oh, sorry. Hi, guys. We're back with Mark Who 42. <laughs> <laughs> Oh wow, Chief Masterson! Thank was you. That <laughs> I think that was fair. Oh, that was, that was, All yeah. right, just kidding. I love you guys. This is fun, and it's so fun to have our second half here. And thank you guys for sticking through our commercial breaks. What else do I say? What do I? No, say? just let us know. You're listening <laughs> to Krypton Radio. Yeah, you're listening to Krypton Radio. That. Yeah. Well, thanks, Chase. And of course, you know, I'm Mark Baumgarten, and we've got Christian Basil and Eduardo M. Fryer. And, well, Chase, you're the reason we're really here. I mean, we are here to interview you. And like the assignment you gave us to do during the commercial break, yes. I sat down during the commercial break, Timey Wimey was able to do it in less than the 30 seconds that we had, and watched Are You Our Genesis. Okay. And what do you think? I loved it. Thank you. I loved it's it. Good, isn't short, it? Short film, but I, I know it's a teaser for the upcoming film. It's good, isn't it? It's stylish. It's sleek. It's stylish. You know what that you. I, Okay. And I get the feeling you know stylish when you see it. I know stylish, and you <laughs> I know you do. Marvelous. You, oh, well, first, you. Mark, if I can say, well, I I watched it as well, mm -hmm. and well, first off, I gotta say kudos to you guys. 
for throwing in references to Metropolis. I love the movie Metropolis. So right, yeah. See, seeing the scenes of the robot from Metropolis, I, I was just like, yes. I Well, no, remember, Maria is the girl. Oh, that's the right. Robot, but, but the robot, but is the named robot Hell. looks like Maria because it's, by, it's the same actress, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, they, they transformed her. Right, Maria. right, right, right. But yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Very stylish. I love the aesthetic, especially that little... Hover car, hover jet thingy. The that, hover that car jet thingy. The hover car jet. I, I don't know what yeah, the comes up with great yeah. names for these vehicles. It? It's good, isn't it? It's a well done oh, yeah, piece, no, and I, I really am very. I, I, I think it's just a fantastic piece of work, and I want to see the finished film because I want to find out what happens. Thank you. Well, there you go. Um, it, it's a very solid story, and James Kerwin, the writer director, um, did an excellent job with that. And the feature script is even better; it's really strong. And uh, Jason Cochard, our director of photography, he was also the DP for Yesterday Was a Lie, which was the first project that we all did together. As I was mentioning, it's a sci-fi noir, shot in classic black and white, highly award-winning. I'm really proud of it, and it was theatrically released. So Jason is back with us for RUR, and yeah, we're proud of it. Can't wait for the feature. And this was based on a play by Carl Chopek. Oh, yes. In 1918. 1918. Origin into the word robot. That's amazing. Exactly. It's, it's great. And, you know, I love at the end when the RUR, I guess the tattoo of the RUR on both the main characters. Yeah. Yeah. So we know what's going on there. It looks like it's going to be really good. Speaking of robots. Yes. Speaking of robots. I have nothing to go from there. But... <laughs> <laughs> drinking uh, we should yeah. <laughs> i think you have yeah, yeah I, why don't you tell the audience what happened during our commercial break go ahead <laughs> go ahead well you know they, no no they, really they were drinking in our genesis so i was drinking it was there was a bar oh blame it on bar. <laughs> oh, oh, a bar. go ahead bar. more more <laughs> more Mark, we were networking. We were networking. You called it a plug, so you started drinking. <laughs> networking. There's that word again. Oh, Lord. Like networking. Um, All right. Yeah, I think Mark has a mini bar at his house when he does the show. I'm sure our audience has questions for us besides what have you been drinking. So let's get you know to I, it. Well, but you know what? Look, I, I just want to say I, I drink bottled water every time that we record this, okay? I'm being a good boy here. Oh, little, okay, or, okay. It's just plain okay. bottled water. So I want you to tell us about Vienna. We started to talk about Vienna a little in the first half. Wait, we're not supposed to say her name out loud, aren't we? Uh, no, no, you can't say her name. But you know what? In Series 2, a lot of people were saying your name out loud because you were working for Crime Corps and you were not actually an assassin killing people. There were people who knew your name. Right. People can say my name in Series 2, but not Series 1, so not it really depends. One. That's your reward for getting through Series 1, is that now you can say my name. So or now you can know my name. Because actually, you can't, even, you can't even know my name until no, Series you, you 2. you can't know your name. But no. now, now, someone else learned your name. It was one of the worlds of Big Finish. Cade Zorn figured out who you were. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. A, another person who we've had on the show before was allowed to say your name. Uh, when she told you her name. Who was that? Uh, Lisa Bowerman. Oh, Lisa Bowerman. Well, she's Summer. exceptional, though. She, she she's, is exceptional. You know, Benny can do whatever she wants. Yeah. And yeah. she can she can we live after saying your name. We all know that by now, yes. Yeah. Yes. No, that I, I think that was great. The fact that they did Worlds of Big Finish to basically, you know, showcase all their yeah. other features, Big Finish, and so that you'd want to listen to the series. Yeah. Isn't it wise and brilliant and fun? The way that they tied all that together, that's the brainchild of Scott Hancock. And it was really a, a truly cool thing to be a part of. I don't want to give too much away because it just came out recently. And I don't want to yeah. uh, give you know the plot and stuff because I don't like spoilers, of course. Yeah, it did come out recently. But I, I hope you guys are loving it and checking it out because it's a great way to get acquainted with the parts of Big Finish that you guys don't know yet. So I, I had not listened to the Dorian Gray stories, so I may start listening to them now because that was it was a good episode. Yeah, but... I hope everybody at home understands what we're doing. <laughs> we're talking <laughs> and, Big Finish and taking notes there. I'm lost. No, no, see, because Vienna Salvatore. Uh-huh. Uh, first appeared in a Sylvester McCoy Doctor Who audio, mm-hmm. uh, uh-huh. The Shadow Heart. Yes. 
And got to catch you, up on my big finish. You do. What's wrong with you? <laughs> There's so much of it out there, and I have a little budget. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> I like the whole set. Yeah, I, I see. I don't pay him much, like nothing, so they don't get extra money from this. So they. Oh, good. Yeah, he doesn't pay us. <laughs> I don't pay him, so they have to do their research. <laughs> Okay, I guess that's fine then. Whatever. <laughs> but anyway, you've got Series 3 of Vienna coming out soon, I think. Yes, uh, it probably will be out next February. They tend to come out in February right around Galfrey. Galfrey mm-hmm. 1. Because we love Galfrey 1. Hi, Galfrey 1. <laughs> Hi, Sean Lyons. You're wonderful. Anyway, we love that con, and um, we also love Chicago TARDIS and, and uh, all the rest of them, but this tends to work out well with the timing. And so I look for it in February of 2015. Okay. Uh, speaking of conventions, Doctor Who or Star Trek, which fans are the craziest? Uh, the craziest? Well, you know, I, oh. just tell, I, I just threw that word out, but what the difference between the fans? You know, there, it's funny. Um, there is a very distinct difference in fandom. There's a, a playfulness with the Doctor Who fans that is more in, in the mainstream of them. It's it, like you go to a Who convention, and honestly, like 80% of people are cosplaying. It's yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, you can't, like, I'd say maybe even more. 80% is very conservative uh, uh, as a guess. 80, 90, even more, it seems I'm like so sometimes you just can't walk through the hall without, like, running into a Dalek. I mean, right. they're just everywhere. And then there's, like, Hawaii Dalek and, like, <laughs> You know, James Bond, Dalek. There's, I mean, there's a playfulness in all of it that's really, really fun. And maybe that's because a lot of the Doctor Who fans are younger because there's a, obviously the resurgence has brought in the new audience, whereas the Trek fans are – I mean, there's a lot of young Trek fans, but – I don't know that they're con- the convention going Trek fans. Right. You know, I mean, I think there's a lot of closeted Trek fans, frankly, that are younger. And so we don't see them at cons. Whereas Doctor Who fans just let it all hang out. You know, they're, they're there and they're in their Dalek outfit and they're having fun. And it's, it's wonderful. It really is. I mean, you see weeping angels all over the place and just all the doctors are represented in cosplay and Cybermen. It's really fun. The Whovians are more fun. Hmm. I just yeah. have to. Go back to that whole I, I really do think that. I don't think they're more fun. I think they're the fandoms. I'm just really being honest. Are equally fun, but Have there's more stuff. of a playfulness definitely in in the Who fandom. Trek fans are fun in their own different ways. You know, I mean, Trek fans are fun too. Don't get me wrong. We have plenty of Ferengi women showing up practically <laughs> naked. Oh no! Where was this again? Yes, that's just wrong. <laughs> I know. I, they, they, do they all look like Andrea Martin? I mean, it's terrifying. Be careful what you eat for breakfast because yeah, you're going to see them, and you, it may not go what? well. No, no. I, oh no! I, oh, I'm, it is fun though. It's fun. Just uh-huh. think about this Hawaiian Dalek. Instead of an eye stalk, it's been replaced by a tiki torch. I mean, <laughs> it's just going around up there. <laughs> Exterminate. <laughs> oh, God, like a Aloha. Aloha. Christian <laughs> barbecue. <laughs> Uh, wow. Actually, Chris, wow. Christian and Christian and Trish are the big Disney people in the group. See, I'm now picturing a bunch of Daleks trying to sing the Tiki Room theme. Oh, exactly. Since <laughs> oh, it's God, Disney, God. it's going to cost oh. you big time. So I don't know if you the might want to just check your bank account. Tiki Room. The Dalek covered in poop. <laughs> Chase, we actually had three different actors, people you might know. We had Travis Ritchie, we had Eric Loya, and we had... Carrie Kernan. I love from those guys. Spectres. And you've been on panels with them. And I was absolutely excited when I heard that you were going to be doing the inspector. But do you know, uh, how did you come across those three? And how's it going so far with the inspector? It's so funny. I met Travis backstage at the closing ceremony of Galley, I guess it was two years ago. Huh? And we happened to be standing next to each other for this, this closing, and somebody introduced us, and he said, oh, I've been meaning to come say hello, and I'd heard about what he had done and, and just, you know, loved it. I hope this feature goes. I really do. The script is fun, and it says a lot of good things. I hope it goes, too, because I contributed money to it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, it's... Yeah, we got Indigo money in there. We got Indigo money in there. Yeah, they, they don't get paid, but... but... Travis does, yeah. I'm sure it will go at some point then. Uh, no, I don't know. I don't know what is is going to happen with it. 
Travis is extremely talented, and the writing is fantastic. Travis and Eric have written a really fine piece of science fiction. It's got everything that science fiction really needs. Strong characters and interesting journeys that they each go through, and a really cool allegory in plot, and really excellent themes. It's not... I don't know. I mean, it's not a, a film that should just be bypassed and overlooked. The problem is, is that the fan base can only sustain so much. I mean, right. Right. It, you can't make a film on the, the small amount of money that we've raised. The fan base well, yeah. is enthusiastic, but it's not huge in terms of the grand scheme of things. I mean, you know, there's a lot of science fiction competing for the fans' attention and dollars. And so that, it's hard to say what's going to happen with it. I hope it happens. I really do. Well, is it still in an idea format, or did they actually give you a, a written script? Oh, no, it's a full script. It's, there's oh, been okay. a feature script for a couple of years now. Oh, okay. Well, my email is marku <laughs> yeah. media at yahoo.com. No, I, I know. I, I, I would <laughs> no, love to send it. I, I don't have the authority to do that, but oh, no, no. Oh, you guys will love it when it comes out, and I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, I, I don't know where they are going to hear. You'll get to work with Sylvester again. I know. I know. He's so wonderful. I love him so much. And he's just as fun off stage as he is on stage. Oh, I know it. I got to interview him at Shock Pop Comic Con uh, a couple of months ago, and he actually played Spoons on me. He on you? Spoons on me. Yeah, on oh, okay. There's a video on, video on YouTube. YouTube. There's a video on YouTube uh, of him playing the spoons, and he ends by playing it on my head. Yeah. Well, Mark, also remember a couple of years back when he was at the Bon Voyage party? Oh, yeah. Actually, I remember there was people getting married and he actually walked the bride down the aisle yeah he's a great guy sylvester he's, he's pretty great oh he did walk the, oh that's so fun oh no i want to get married so he can walk me down the aisle yeah there you go Aww. okay i'll have to figure that out anyway yeah he's, he's great he's great we love sylvester he's definitely my favorite doctor he's my clark gable oh yeah Whoa. sexiest man alive easily that's great yeah who's your clark gable my Clark Cable? I don't have a Clark Cable. No, I, hey, it's, look, Do I want to, okay. 2015, okay, guys. Okay, right, right, okay, okay. Okay, you can just say the regular answer then. Who's your doctor? My, I'm sure all these people know. Okay, well, I, they all know it would be classic series, The Tom. Of Tom course. Baker. Yes, we, uh, yes. But right now, my favorite new series doctor is Peter Capaldi. I love Peter. He's great. You mentioned that before the commercial break. Yes, you know, I, yeah. I like him. He's a little grumpy. But I like the grumpiness. The show started with the doctor being grumpy, William no. Hartnell, in the 60s. It's it's good, now that he's started his regeneration cycle again, to be grumpy again. Okay, fine. We, yeah, I'm <laughs> just saying. So that means that after... I hate grumpy. Grumpy is gross. Right? Grumpy, you know what? Grumpy just pisses me off. You know, you guys... Oh, just, no. No, grumpy no, no. is like not... Uh, well, grumpy, over grumpy. But you know what? But but here's the thing. People are grumpy. When grumpy goes away, we get hobo, we get comedy, we get lovable. Then that's going to happen next. And then after that, we should get Sean Pertwee because John's son looks just like him. And well, did you see that article that came out okay. online? That article that just came out online about Sean Pertwee and John Pertwee looking alike and being alike. I said that a year ago on the first episode of Gotham, and now a year later, they're finally putting it on the web. I'm sorry, that's I, I'm ahead of my time. Yeah, you're definitely ahead of your time. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I'm going to say it again. Now that we have proof on the web, we actually have a still image from Gotham. <laughs> You know, somebody please talk to Stephen Moffat. Get Sean Pertwee on to play his dad's doctor. But okay, we're we're, we're straying away from Chase, and I don't want to do that because Chase, you're, we're we're here for you. And I want you to, Ed, I'd like you to ask Chase a question about Deep Space Nine. Well, actually, I know you've been well, wanting actually, to. Well, didn't she want to know who our doctors were? Oh, so that's right. I always Mark do Davis. that, don't I? Why do you do that? I always okay. do that. I always interrupt. Who do you want to talk to next, Chase? Yeah, I could just go if you guys want to talk amongst no, yourselves. No, I'm, no, kidding. Chase, no, I'm kidding. Them. I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> fine. I'm enjoying this. It's fine. It's fine. I'm just kidding. We love you, Chase. <laughs> All right. We love you, too. So what do you, what's next? What? what? Who, who's your Clark Gable, Ed? We'll go with what you answered, Mark, you know, with who's your favorite doctor. And I'm with Mark. I love, I love Tom Baker. As David Tennant told Peter Davidson, you're my doctor. Tom is my doctor. I actually took one of his quotes, and I have that on my social media pages. It's like just the quote I live by. 
That's pretty you know, sweet. I, I love the Tom. As for new series doctors, I like Peter Capaldi, but until I think the writing can really allow him to really take over, mm-hmm. I'm going to go with the dark horse. I'm going to go with Christopher Eccleston. Oh. He had a nice mix of grumpy and funny, you know, and the grumpy actually had something to it, you know, because this was immediately after the time war. So he still thought his people were gone. So he's kind of working through it. So makes sense. if you're just joining us, we have an interview with Chase Masterson. Oh, well. We do have a no, no big deal. She did. Hey, no, no, she Chase asked right. a question. That's what Chase asked a question. Don't mind me. <laughs> Chase asked she a asked question. Her. I know. Answering your question, who is my Clark Gable? Yeah, I have to ride with the guys. It's the fourth doctor. And I take it a little bit more personally because when I grew up, I didn't have that hero that I enjoy. I didn't like the Superman. I didn't like Batman. I didn't like I liked the Transformers a little, but I didn't really have the hero that was in my life until I saw PBS. And there he was, Tom Baker with the scarf, floppy hair, jelly babies and everything like that. He was totally a different type of hero. He was somebody who didn't use brute strength. He didn't have a a utility belt. He used his his intelligence and his wit to just put it in the bad guy's face. And every time he got into the bad guy's face, it was always enjoyable. You know, he he would get in front of the bad guy who was all mangled up and everything, and he would go, Chop Suey, the Galactic Emperor, and something like that. Some kind of little tidbit, but he was my hero. And that was something I looked up to because in my life, you know, I always thought intelligence and things were more important than trying to build muscle. It was always to build brain power. So that's why I've always related to the doctor. Granted, I couldn't tell anybody in high school they thought I was nuts. So I stayed in the closet for as long as I can. It gets rebooted by Christopher I Eccleston. I told people and I go. got beat up. That's basically what I <laughs> No, Ed, go for Deep Space Nine. I know you want to. I did ask you, Chase, before the break. I did ask you about shooting the Mirror Mirror stuff. But um, getting away from that, you know, how was it just working on Deep Space Nine in general? Um, it was a great show to be on. It was, you know, here we are 20 years later. How bad can that be? Um, it was just... An incredible experience to be a part of such a, a legacy, you know, a human global legacy. And I mean, did you hear about the guy that has a trillion dollar company who made his office into the Enterprise building? I think I saw yes, that. Yes, yeah. China. Yeah. I mean, We're talking about that. I mean, this show, it, it erases boundaries, really. And that's exactly the way the world should be. That's the kind of world that I want to live in, that I think most Trek fans want to live and in. And it's what Gene Roddenberry had intended. Oh, yeah. And it is absolutely, and that's so important to keep in mind that entertainment needs to inspire us in those ways and to remind us of what is important and what's just not acceptable. You know, racism is not acceptable. Sexism is not acceptable. Ageism is not acceptable. And it, there, all of these things were things that Roddenberry knew 50 years ago, and it's unfortunate that the world is still having to learn them. I think we've come a long way, and I think that the Trek community is a group of people that live in that space, and the Doctor Who communities. Most science fiction fans understand these things. It's unfortunately the rest of the world that needs to catch up, and... Yeah. I'm hoping that the science fiction communities can can build tent poles with each other and be able to harness each other's fandoms and bring that kind of support to real world issues. That's part of why I founded the Pop Culture Anti Bullying Hero Coalition. Tell um, us a little about that because yeah, that, that was definitely something we should talk about. Well, thanks. I founded it because I realized that no one had ever done anything for heroism and against bullying in real life at a pop culture convention. And here our stories are all about those important issues, and yet we weren't making the connection to real life often enough. I fully believe Roddenberry were alive today. He would be doing this kind of thing. Yeah. Did you see that video a while back, which was Will Wheaton? from Next Generation at a convention, and he did talk to a fan during a Q and A. It's and, good. It's yeah. good to talk to a fan, but what about talking on a regular basis to the world? Yeah. I mean, quite frankly, it's that's great. Yay, we all do that. It's and I'm glad that Will did it, and we all do that. But let's make this a real solid 
global effort, right? Am right. I wrong no, here? I, mean, I, I, I agree with I, you. Oh, no, I don't where, know. Where, so. where can we get more information about this? Antibullyingcoalition.com is our website. Mm-hmm. You can follow us on Twitter at, at antibullyingco. We're partnered with the United Nations Association. Oh. Um, yep, I called them and I said, well, we're doing this thing. We're making a stand against bullying and racism and misogyny and LGBT mm-hmm. bullying and all forms of hate. We're making this stand. You guys make this stand on a global level. Level. We're making it at Comic Cons. Want to come to Comic Con? And they were like, "Oh my gosh, we've always wanted to get into Comic Con." <laughs> this is the UN Association. Wow. So I said, "Yeah, come on over." So they did, and we did the same thing with the Anti Defamation League, which is oh as really? You guys know, really? Mm-hmm, yeah. a global organization standing against hate. They have a great thing that works against bullying in schools, and we did the same thing with Glisten and Cartoon Network. Stop Speak Up has an outreach, and lots of cool organizations were the first people to ever bring the Girl Scouts of America to a convention because they have an anti-bullying effort. And this is what we need to be doing. It's good to say a thing at a convention, but it's really good for all of us to make this stand to make Um, this stand that it's unacceptable it's not just what we like to do and need to wave the flag let's get in there and get our hands dirty do you understand yeah i do yeah Yeah. chase one more time the the website antibullyingcoalition.com in the next month or so we're going to rebrand it to have its name be the pop culture hero coalition because we want nice yeah thank you um some people like that name. Some people don't quite understand the crossover. I think it's an important distinction to make because it's not just teaching against bullying, which is teaching against a negative. It's teaching for a positive. And there's lots of ways that we can work as heroes in this world, in real life. We love superheroes. Why not be one? That's our you know, It's motto. funny you should bring that up because we were just having an interview recently where the subject of our interview was saying they were talking about protests and saying, how about instead of anti this, pro this, like try to turn it into a positive so i it's funny you should bring that up and and i gotta agree with both of you thank you thank you well i mean it's look this is what we're on the planet to do i mean everything that entertainment does is great and there's nothing against i mean i have nothing against having like just fun stuff that leads to nowhere but when we're able to change the world with entertainment and have it go beyond being just a television show that speaks to our hearts but actually gets stuff done, that's best-case scenario, right? I mean, it's a hurting yeah. world out there, and we are privileged. I mean, we're sitting here on a podcast. Mm-hmm. Just, I mean, how many things within that you can note about yourself within 10 seconds are incredibly privileged. And so why not spread that? Why not try to stand up for people who don't have it quite so good? Now, Chase, do you have an online presence? (laughs) Do I have an online presence? In other words, Twitter, Facebook, website? I do. I do. I'm at Chase Masterson. Thank you. At Chase Masterson on Twitter. And my website is chasemasterson.com. I have Chase Masterson page on Facebook. And... I haven't had time to do the rest. I don't have an Instagram. I think at some point I'll have an Instagram. I started thinking about doing that. I don't have Instagram. Yeah. I don't even have Twitter. No, we, I, we're I just... Facebook, Twitter, Facebook, Twitter. From Yeah, uh, Twitter's my main thing. I don't post a lot on Facebook. Yeah, find me there. Cool. I understand. It's but, too much up the, of it out there. It's Snapchat. It's Pinterest. And I'm just like, yeah, I can't keep up with all. Yeah, this. social. Yeah, that's, media well, well, that's the, well. That's the reason. Easy. That's the reason that I basically stick to Facebook. It's like, okay, I just want to, you know, email and Facebook. Okay, I don't. I don't want to have to juggle all this. But getting to more positive things, uh, if we could jump back to Deep Space Nine for a second. Uh, what was it? Okay, so the main character was Benjamin Sisko, played by Avery Brooks. Before going into Deep Space Nine, he was known for being the man called Hawk from Spencer for Hire, and mm-hmm. I think he had yeah. his own spinoff. What was it like working with – is he as cool – in real life as he looks on screen. How do you mean cool? Like, I mean, is he, I mean, just, what, 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 what is he, because he just, he just seems Badass, like, how about that? There, there, there you go. There Badass. you go. There you go. That's the, yeah. I, I didn't, didn't want to say that. Uh, I see it's a character that we see on TV, the same personality and traits of Benjamin Sisko, the same as the actor. Okay. I'd be honest and say that Avery is a really... Um, is he a cat? I wouldn't say that. You wouldn't say that. Okay. I would say Oh, come say on. He that. punched out Q. He punched out Q, Mark. <laughs> look, Avery's got a great look, and he knows how to use stillness and silence. Yeah, he does, doesn't he? As, as an actor, um, I think... As a person, Avery is just as vulnerable and scared as anybody else. 
and he chooses to mask that in different ways, as we all do. Okay, if then. Michael Dorn uh, somehow gets his Worf series off the ground, would you like to be in it? I don't think that's going to happen. I don't mean I, that yeah, in a I... bad way, but it's just, you know, there's so many ideas of what's going to be the next Star Trek. Do you think Star Trek is ever going to come back to television? Because J.J. Abrams has got the movie thing going and in an alternate universe or whatever, and, it, you know, it's been a long time since Enterprise. You know, we have haven't had Star Trek on TV in a long time. Yeah, it has been a long time. Um, I do think it will go back to television. I think that CBS is too greedy for it not to. <laughs> but I think that it will still be a while. I don't think it's going to happen any extreme time soon. They've been tossing around ideas. Do you think the storyline from everything that we've grown up with, Deep Space Nine, Next Generation, Enterprise, do you think that will have a continued sense? Or do you think it's like the movies, it's going to reboot altogether? We're going to start from ground zero and, and co- but, come up with something else. This isn't any kind of an educated guess except for just keeping my eyes open, I would imagine they're going to reboot. They're going to try to tie it in 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 some ways, as they did, but I think it will be, for all intents and purposes, a reboot. I don't think you're going to see a lot of the same. Guys, it's a money game. They're going to keep as much of Star Trek as they feel like they need to keep for the mainstream fans because Mm -hmm. they know that they would be nowhere without them. But they also are going to try to make it cross all those bridges and bring in a new fan base. I mean, if they were only going for the old fan base, they would have done something right after Enterprise or shortly after. They're going to try to bring in new fans, a fresh start. So it's dicey as to how much Star Trek there will be in it. I mean, there will be enough Star Trek in it, but I just don't know how much of Star Trek as we know it. Yeah. Characters, situations, all of that. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe next year, because next year is the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So, I mean, something could happen then. Well, we're kind of hoping that they probably would learn from what Doctor Who is, because it took a leave of absence for quite oh, some yeah. time. Yeah. But it didn't necessarily reboot. They kept going because they paid homage to everything that came before and said, we're just going to continue on. But the one thing that I think was important to keep it going was everybody who rebooted it were all fans when they grew up. So they not only had the experience and the know-how because uh, I think Russell T. Davis was doing Queer as Folk and some other projects and everybody had done other things beforehand. They had the love that I think a lot of shows don't pick up that Doctor Who had something going for because it had that experience of love during that time that they were growing up. And I think that's how it keeps going. So I'm hoping that maybe Star Trek will continue on when they, a new generation of fans come in, take over and say, listen, this is we had the love for this. We can keep everything and still keep going and still keep it fresh for a whole new audience that's coming in. Yeah. Just me, that's just my Maybe take on Maybe Will Whedon will be the next showrunner of yeah. Star Trek. No, I uh, hope not. I'm sorry, Will. I don't mean to say that. Hey. Um, I don't hey, mean to nice diss Will. I like, I, Will's a cool guy. Got to ask, what is your craziest con moment? My craziest con moment? Yeah. Wow. I, 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 I specify in quotes crazy. Jeez. Uh, hmm. Craziest. Uh, uh, uh. I am permanently scarred by those Ferengi women coming over naked. It just, wow. <laughs> it was kind of nuts. Really kind of nuts. Um, I, I had fun with the Starfleet cheerleaders. All We all did this big cheer last year, and that was fun. And we, we do have a good time. I don't know. My personal craziest moments probably when my friend Kathy and I toilet papered the door of the Italian convention host at this small convention in Italy. We toilet papered her <laughs> hotel door so she couldn't get out. Okay. <laughs> but, um, uh, is, was there any reason why that no, you could share? No, well, that's crazy. I don't know because I'm a high schooler. I don't know. <laughs> there was there toilet was, paper. It was 4 o'clock in the morning and there was toilet paper. I don't know. We were just playing. There's lots of fun stuff that happens at conventions. I guess that's not that crazy. Well, you guys are drinking on Saturday morning. Talk about oh, crazy. Well, I don't no, know. Mark, no, Mark What's is the crazy I'm, according to you. I told you, you I'm, doing, I'm doing bottled water, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm okay. being a good boy. Right. I'm just doing bottled water. I'm, I'm being a professional. Mark is the one who decides every time somebody does a plug or what he considers a plug, he has to take a shot. Okay. Recently, you did do an episode of The Flash, the new CW yeah. series. What was it like working on that? It was fun. I love that team. Um, the I think it's a fantastic show. It's well deserved to be the People's Choice favorite new drama. It really deserves all of the incredible acclaim that it's gotten. It's a fantastic have you, story. Have you watched like Have you watched like the entire series? I have. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you, um, I mean, it's only I mean, what, season season one, but it's really a fine show. It says a lot of great things. The themes are very powerful, and I think that it's going to run for many years. Andrew Kreisberg, the executive producer, wrote the role for me, so I didn't have to audition or anything, and that was a real nice. treat. Um, yeah, it was nice. I take some time off from doing TV for some family reasons, and I was uh, really happy to get to have him. You know, he just said, hey, come back. Come back and now, show. Okay, now if I can ask you this. So you have made your mark on uh, the DC universe, but yep. would you want to work on any of the Marvel projects? Well, who wouldn't? I mean, yes. Okay. Would you? So that's, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, that's yeah. It. Heck yeah. I mean, I think hopefully any of the guys who are handling Marvel TV or Marvel movies are listening to this. Give Chase a roll. Yeah. You know, give Chase a roll. Uh, if you're trying to figure out what to give her, contact me. I'm the one with a huge collection of Marvel handbooks. We will find something for her. Thank you. you know, if there's if there's a superheroine you want to play, uh, let me know. I'll bug the Marvel guys till they give it to you. Okay, I had to take another drink then, and and and, and I'm now. So you are drinking no, during our show. That was not a plug. Okay. That was not a plug. That was not a plug. It was. It I'm was. Hey, Chase. With all the. Okay. Anyway. Uh, Chase, I am not going to take a drink on this one, but we're at the point of the show where we allow our guests to plug away, and we will not drink. We will not drink. Oh. Plug away. Okay. So what's coming up for Chase Masterson? Oh. Uh, what's coming up for Chase Masterson? Um, I would love for you guys to, um, if you haven't watched RUR, definitely check that out. If you have interest in saying to antibullyingcoalition.com and also follow Antibullying Co. on Twitter. Season three of Vienna is something that we just recorded and that'll be out soon. Uh, I'd like, well, I don't know. Not that soon, I guess. It's only until June, so that'll be out next year. If you haven't heard Vienna, I would say that would be something I'm really proud of, and check that out. And other than that, I just got a new manager and a new agent, and I'll be back doing some television. Not sure exactly what yet, but starting to work again, and that feels good. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Thank you. (laughs) Something that really does matter these days, as, as crazy as it is, they watch how many Twitter followers you have. So I would say find me. Everybody and... listen, uh, yes, everybody listening to this interview, go to Twitter. And what, what was your Twitter again? At Chase Masterson? At Chase Masterson, yeah. And follow her. Get her. Um, we're we're going to bring some people in, get a lot of people for you, and you'll get on Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, it'll work just or, like would that. You prefer, or would you prefer Agent Carter? Because since that takes place in the... 40s and 50s, you get to dress, period. Well, why don't we just go with whatever they'd like first, and then I'll... That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Go for what they offer you. There we go. (laughs) Don't forget to follow us, just in case. Yeah, Yeah, go to at Marku42. I I do have one follow-up question, and it's from the heart. With your work in the anti-bullying and being role models, who was your role model? Oh, wow. Did you have more than one? My parents cared a, a lot about the world. I lost my dad, but my mom and dad really did give me some really solid understandings about making the world a better place. And that, you know, it's so important to lead people. Uh, um, Role models are only role models if you actually do what they do. You know, I mean, I just want to say that that's really an important issue. You can have a role model be a sports figure. And I guess you can get your, obviously, determination and persistence and discipline and all of that from from those people. But role models are, uh, uh, it's important for us to do. I think that's really a, a hugely key word. There's so much chatter on the Internet. There's a lively discussion about everything these days. But unless we really get out there and get our hands dirty, like I said, that it doesn't matter. I mean, it does. I can't say that. I really, really take that back, Internet. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. There are a lot of things that we can do by using our voice. That's hugely important. But call your congressman if you want to make the world a better place. Let your voice really be heard, not just on social media. There are a lot of things that we can do in the world. And this is a really long-winded answer. My my parents were doers, and and I'm grateful for that example. So more or less just saying that people should be their own role models. They should set the standards for what they believe in to improve them. 
don't just have them in our just look up at the sky actually go, film, go fuck be, you there. be them yeah. yeah exactly well also you were saying chase that it's more than just social media would you also like i i've been a part of a couple of things where we've actually gone to the halls of both state and national congress to like knock on doors would you say that's also something that should be looked into absolutely yeah and vote wisely chase masterson i want to thank you so very much for being with us here at Marku 42. Thank you. It was fun, guys. It was. You know what? It feels Thank like you. Thank you very it much. feels like over two weeks have gone by during this interview. <laughs> we have been with you for so long. It feels like we are just together for so long. It's just amazing. It's been a long time, guys. It's been a long time. All right. Time. Not that. Not that it's been a bad. Not thing. a it's bad been, long it's time. Been a good, it's been a. Good, it's been a good. Time. Two weeks. Memories. Good, good, thing. Two weeks. good time. All right. Well, thanks, guys. I was happy to be on, and, and I look forward to getting a link and letting people know when this is up and all that. Thank you very much, Chase. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank Chase Masterson once again. That was a great interview. Don't forget to listen to our show every week here on Krypton Radio. And you can find us also at marku42.net, iTunes, Stitcher Radio, geekcastradio.com, floridageekscene.com, and a lot of places around the net. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our show, and we'll be back next time here on Marku 42. Marku 42 was written and presented by Mark Baumgarten, Patricia Helm, Christian Basil, Patty Hawkins, and Eduardo M. Fryer. This show was edited, produced, and directed by Mark Baumgarten. Please visit Marku42.net and register to join and be a part of the Universal Army. Contacted by email at mark at marku42.net with the subject line question mark. If you have worked on Doctor Who or are working on a project relating to Doctor Who and want to be on our radio show, please email our media relations director, Christian Basil, at marku42media at yahoo.com. Doctor Who and its properties are owned by the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. This show is owned and copyrighted by Mark Baumgarten 2015. You're listening to Krypton Radio.